Hey, it's Sela Social Studies. Back to Sela Social Studies. Now we're going to cover your post World War II final assessment review. Study, study, study. All right, I want you to remember: do not just use this video because all I have is I have a blank note sheet here with just some some notes on it, and. Um, I try to cover as much as I can in a short amount of time possible to give you kind of like the overarching theme of the, uh, the of the chapter. And what I want you to do is I want you to read over your note sheet. What I learned when I went to college is if I learned if I read something three times, I knew pretty much the majority of it just after reading it three times. I know it might be a lot, but set yourself up that picture of what's going on in the world post World War II. So the first thing we cover was post World War politics. What happened in the world? If you remember correctly, we had the Yalta Conference discussing what the future of Europe was going to look like. You had the Potsdam Conference that did two things. Number one, it told uh, Japan to surrender. Number two, it divided Germany and Berlin into four, uh, which pieces that were controlled by each one of the allied powers, Britain, France, United States, and the Soviet Union. And if you remember that the Soviet Union was communist and the other three allied powers were leading like with a democratic type government. So now you have Berlin, which is divided in four, three of them, which happen to be democratic in all of East Germany, which is now all communist. So you have what we call the Berlin airlift. If you remember what I was saying, uh, Stalin uh, tried to go ahead and stop everybody from going into or leaving Berlin, trying to suffocate out the allies. But Truman's like, I don't think so. We're not even going to have that. We're going to go ahead and dump a bunch of supplies in there, which really sets forth the Cold War, the Red Scare, the fear of communism. And now we have the trying to control uh, or the global supremacy between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, in response to the war, we create the United Nations. Remember, the U.S. failed to join the League of Nations, but we're not going to fail to join the United Nations to, to go ahead and try to uh, resolve international issues. The Soviet Union is communist. Um Winston Churchill says that the division between communist countries and the rest of the world is like an iron curtain because everything on the inside of that communism is gross and it's it's terrible and we don't like it. And it just really divides what the world should be from what the world really is inside of communism. Uh, the uh, United States joins NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. What this is, is these are a group of countries. It's about nine of them that get together. Um, United States, Canada, Iceland, some Western European countries that get together that say, hey, listen, uh, Soviet Russia, if you attack one of us, we are going to collectively get together and attack you. The Soviet Union is like, all right, you think you're funny? I'm going to go ahead and create the Warsaw Pact, which is the same thing. I'm going to take these Eastern European countries that I made communist. I'm going to take some other communist countries and say, if you attack any of us, we're going to go ahead and collectively attack one of you. How do we go ahead and try to contain communism? We don't want it to spread. We don't want to go to war to try to stop it because that would kill millions upon millions of more. So we use a theory of containment or idea of containment. Try to contain it. Just like putting a uh, liquid in a bowl, you are containing it to that bowl. You're not spreading it out. You're not, you're not letting it just spill all over the place. And that was the idea. And we do this many different ways. We have the Truman, uh, the Truman Doctrine, which was trying to aid Turkey and Greece, giving them money uh, to try to say, hey, you know, if communist Russia tries to come in here and take you over, say no. Remember where you got that money from, that aid from. You got it from the United States. So George Marshall, the Secretary of State, I believe at the time, comes up with what we call the Marshall Plan. He's going to give a boatload of money to Europe to say, hey, guys, here, fix up your country with this money. Um but really, he's going to call it a humanitarian aid to try not to agitate the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union gets mad seeing that we're trying to help everybody. Then they're going to go ahead and declare war on us. So it's a humanitarian idea. Um, African-Americans are facing discrimination in uh, in the United States. And that's where we come into. I think we covered the North Korea or the war in Korea next. So where does uh, communism spread? Asian nations like China under Mao Zedong. Then it goes into North Korea. If you remember after World War II, United States Soviet Union liberated Korea from Japan. So we kicked them out, but we both wanted a piece. The United States and the Soviet Union wanted a piece of Korea. So the Soviet and Chinese backed North Korea, invade South Korea, who was backed by the United States and the United Nations. For three years, we have a war and we pretty much don't settle anything. It's a stalemate and the ceasefire is called at the 38th parallel. We will stop fighting. Nobody's going to win this war. We've been pushing back and forth and nothing happens. So you have the main combatants of the Chinese 
um, the Russians, North uh, North Korea, South Korea, and the United Nations, United States. So that's who we have during this war. Remember, it was called the Forgotten War. It was small. I actually only had two slides for it. I feel kind of bad. Um, you have the fear of communism. Now you're talking about the Red Scare back in America. People are getting scared about the communists because of all that red on their flag, the yellow hammer and sickle. So we have the fear of communists in the United States. We're having the fear of communism spreading like the domino effect. Once one country fell, other countries would fall and so on and so forth. So we were terrified of that in the United States. And what's one way to sit there and try to combat that? Well, uh, we created the House of Un-American Committee. Uh, activities committee, which said uh, that if you, somebody said that you were a communist, they're going to investigate you and they're going to sit there and try to prove that you are or are, are not a communist. And what? who is one of those people in the United States that really fuels the fire of the Red Scare? Joseph McCarthy, McCarthyism. Joseph McCarthy is that guy's like, you're a communist, you're a communist, you're a communist, we're all communists, right? He's a guy who says, hey, the, the United States government, the Department of uh, Defense, the Department of State has been infiltrated. We have communist spies in there, people working for the communists. And he is literally finger pointing. He's going on TV. He's finger pointing, degrading people, calling them communists, doing all this stuff. By the time McCarthyism ends, the Senate is finally like, dude, you're, you're a little crazy there, man. So by the time that, that this ends, people's reputations are tarnished. People are really scared of the communists. Um, during the Red Scare, we have the arms race. Who's going to build more nuclear weapons? We actually create what we call a hydrogen bomb that does, that does a heck of a lot more damage than the atomic bomb. I think I showed you a chart that said we had like 70,000 up to 120,000 nuclear warheads on planet Earth uh, post-1945, just building and building and building. Soviet Union actually bankrupts itself building so many but we have all these military and nuclear warheads these atomic warheads that eisenhower knows this and he uses a plan called brinksmanship where he says i will go to the brink of war i will put my finger on that button and press that button to launch all these missiles at you soviet union uh if you try to keep taking over more countries so it's what we call brinksmanship i'm going to go to the brink of war to try to avoid it all right and it's all about the nuclear bombs because you have lots of things going on in the cold war try to stop or contain the spread of communism try to build more nuclear weapons than each other try to become the global superiority not even talking uh militarily you're also talking economically right the united states and the soviet union are fighting economically they're not just fighting militarily idea wise they're fighting economically and how does the economy in the united states happen to go fabulous if you're white and want to move to the suburbs right so, like I said, you have all these northern businesses moving to the south um, to, to take advantage of tax cuts and nice weather. So the south finally is starting to get some factories in it. We're starting to become more uh, industrious in the south. Um, people are moving from the cities, white people specifically, moving from the cities, the dirty, filthy, rundown cities, out to the suburbs, that area where you have your own house, your own piece of land, a car, a white picket fence, a dog, and 2.3 kids. Remember that baby boom? All those GIs coming back from war, seeing their girlfriends and wives, and they make families, right? So you have the baby boom. Okay, boomer. You have all these babies being born, white families moving out to the suburbs. They're buying lots of things like washing machines, uh, dishwashers, uh, stoves. They're buying all these new mechanical things, all these new electric things, and we are entering the consumer age. Just keep buying, 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 right? So that's what's going on here. All these people are moving out to the suburbs. You have critics, right? You have critics who are criticizing. Remember we said women are criticizing because they were told to give up their jobs. African Americans were told to give up their jobs. We have segregation, separation of the races still really heavy in the United States at this time. Women are told once they get married to become a housewife. So the Latinos Americans are, are having a problem. They're living in uh, run down areas of the city and Eisenhower actually sets up a program to to send a lot of them uh, to deport a lot of them back to Mexico. You have the Native Americans who are being defunded at this time. So who's really like prospering during post-World War II America? You're talking about white middle class families who move out to the suburbs. If you remember, I during that video, I actually said that uh, many suburban Levittown communities started to suffer because somebody would sell their house to a black family. And if you remember that whole theory about what I said about once the black family moved into that suburb, 
that many of the uh, white Americans would start selling their houses because they felt that the uh, their price value sunk because there was a black family in the neighborhood. Um, and that happened. That truthfully happened. So these are the type of things that were going on post-World War II America. The economy was doing great. But really, unless you were a white American family that moved out to the suburbs, it was a lot harder than than other people. But there's no lie saying that the economy of the of the United States post-World War II was really, really good.